Good evening, and welcome to the Maplewood Mayor and City Council Candidate Forum. I'm Kitty Goggins, a member of the Roseville Area League of Women Voters and a resident of Roseville. I am moderator for this evening's Meet the Candidate Forum. On behalf of the Roseville Area League of Women Voters, I'd like to welcome everyone, the candidates, those watching live, as well as those viewing on demand. The forum will last approximately one and a half hours. The League is a nonpartisan volunteer political organization for both women and men, organized at the local, state, and national level to encourage informed and active participation in government. The forum is part of our ongoing voter education efforts to help voters make informed decisions at the upcoming elections. This allows you an opportunity to hear candidates on issues that are important to you. There is never enough time to cover all the questions in a limited time in settings such as this. If your questions are not addressed, we encourage you to contact the candidates directly. We hope that over the course of this program, you will learn more about the candidates and what they hope to do for Maplewood. While we never endorse a candidate, we are directly involved in shaping the important issues to keep our community strong. If you're interested in learning more about how you can make a similar impact, I would encourage you to look at the League's information available on the website at www.lwvroseville-area.org. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the League of Women Voters. The sp and sponsorship of the forum is not an endorsement by the League for any candidate. All City Council, council candidates listed on the Minnesota State, sorry, Secretary of State website as registered candidates and the two mayoral candidates receiving the highest number of votes in the primary election were invited to this forum. I want to remind the candidates that this forum is being broadcast in its entirety. It will be rebroadcast in its entirety on Channel 16 in Maplewood and is also available on demand at vod.maplewoodmn.gov. This year, the citizens of Maplewood are electing a mayor and two members to the city council. Both mayoral candidates and two of the four city council candidates are able to join us here tonight. Due to COVID-19 variants, coupled with the start of the flu season, we do not have a live audience for today's forum and will be using questions submitted in advance to the local league's email. Only questions that are applicable to all candidates, not personal in nature, and address subjects relevant to this forum will be used. If there are several questions of a similar issue, I will ask a representative question. Answers to the questions similarly need to focus on the questions themselves. A candidate's record may be discussed, but personal attacks will not be tolerated. Let me now introduce the candidates. The two candidates for Maplewood Mayor in alphabetical order by last name are Marilee Abrams and Diana Lungry. Of the four candidates for the two positions on the City Council, two are able to join us here tonight. In alph alphabetical order by last name, Kathleen Juneman and Bill Knutson. For the two candidates unable to join us tonight, Chamberly Marie Lee and Patricia Timmons, I will read the opening and closing statements they submitted. The agenda for tonight will be as follows. All candidates will have two minutes to give an opening statement, and the speaking order was determined randomly before the forum. The timekeeper is sitting in the front row. When there are 30 seconds left for your speaking time, the timekeeper will hold up a yellow card that says 30 seconds. When you see the red stop card, you need to conclude. You can, of course, finish your sentence, but I will enforce this rule to make sure we give the same amount of time to each candidate. I will then ask questions with 90 seconds, or a minute and a half, allowed per response. I will rotate starting order. Based on timing and flow, I may include a lightning round question that only allows a 30 second response. At the end of the question period, you will have two minutes for closing statements that will be given in the reverse order from the opening statements. We will now begin with opening statements. You have two minutes for each response. We will be starting with Diana Lungry. 
Hello, everybody. I'm Diana Longrie, and I'm running for mayor of Maplewood, and I look forward to being your next mayor. Now, one of the things that's the most exciting about this job is actually working with the people of our community and talking with the people and finding solutions for our community with the people of our community. And I look forward to working with you. Now, in about 30 seconds, you'll want to have your pen handy so that I can give you my, name, my phone number and my website. Maplewood, as a first ring suburb, has many challenges that it faces, whether that be uh, crime, um, business climate, protecting our parks, our trails, our open space. And in all of that, we always need to be ever present in looking at protecting our green space and our trails. Because one of the aspects that makes Maplewood special is the amenities that we have to offer our residents. That our trails, our parks, and our open space is that little piece of nature that each one of us gets to enjoy so we don't have to get into a car and drive to the woods somewhere else. It's our little piece of nature and we need to be ever vigilant to protect it from the pressures of development. Now, have you got your pencil ready? Your pen? My phone number is 651-214-0859, website, Diana Longry, all one word, dot com. I look forward to hearing from you. I want to work with you, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Diana Longry. I'm next going to read the, um, the statement that we received from Chunbury Lee. Good evening, League of Women Voters and residents of Maplewood. Please forgive my absence from tonight's public forum. First and foremost, I want to extend thanks to the League of Women Voters for their years of commitment to the community and efforts in creating an opportunity for the candidates of the city of Maplewood to share their perspectives on moving our city into the future as the best place to live, work, play, and retire. I am so fortunate to have resided in Maplewood for the last six years. As a child, I swam in the Maplewood community pool and enjoyed all the amenities the city had to offer, despite the crosstown drive my father had to make from Frogtown. It has always been a place I could see myself living. Who knew that one day, in full circle, I would drive my kids around our city? I have admired the city of Maplewood from a young age and would welcome an opportunity to become a public servant for our city, to serve its residents, and to ensure that our city can continue to flourish. Everyone has their own American dream. I want Maplewood to be a place where those American dreams come to fruition. Part of my dream is to build a life where my family, friends, and neighbors need not worry about a poor quality of life. As a husband and father, I want to contribute on behalf of all families to achieve a more diverse, inclusive, and prosperous city to the place we can all call home. I want all walks of life to feel like Maplewood is where, they're, where they walk of life can bloom. I have been building bridges, making new connections, and meeting my fellow residents since I moved into Maplewood, but the campaign trail has catapulted me to new heights and bringing new perspectives to the city council. I am a man of action. Like my fellow residents, I want our city to embrace diversity, to be socially and economically advantaged, and to be a city people want to establish in. My absence tonight is not because there is no value in sharing my vision with you. Rather, it is because I want to share with you your vision with me. I have spent the last several months knocking doors and calling on residents of Maplewood to learn about what they envision for the future of Maplewood so we can co-create a city we can be proud to call ours. And that is from Chunburi Lee. Next, we have Mary Lee Abrams. I want to say thank you to the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this candidate forum and for all those participating and watching tonight. I'm honored to have served on the Maplewood City Council since 2014 and as the mayor of Maplewood since 2019. I am seeking re-election as the mayor of Maplewood. When I ran for council in 2013, Maplewood was struggling to get away from a very bad reputation and a lot of financial debt. I promised then to help chart a new course for our community, and I believe that I have done that. As mayor, I have led the city through a pandemic 
an economic downturn and a time of social unrest, during which we continued to provide excellent city services to our residents and our businesses. I am running for re-election on my established record as mayor and my commitment to continue to work for all of the families, the neighborhoods, and the businesses in Maplewood. My focus will be on reducing crime, increasing housing options in Maplewood, and redevelopment in our community. I will take my skills and experience gained during my 37 years practicing law and use them to make Maplewood a better place for everyone. During my time as mayor, I spearheaded an initiative to embed two social workers in our Maplewood Public Safety Department. The social workers are a game changer and have helped decriminalize mental health crises and get people the help that they need right now. I've helped increase our community engagement through the creation of our Multicultural Advisory Committee. The MAC forms a bridge between our communities of color and our police department. And I've helped guide the transformation of our fire service from a part-time department to a full-time department, including a new state-of-the-art fire department over at Hazelwood and County Road C. I'm pleased that Maplewood today is well positioned and moving in the right direction. I've lived here for over 28 years, raised my two sons here, and I'm committed to making Maplewood a welcoming place for everyone to live and work. Thank you. Thank you, Marilee Abrams. Next, we have Kathleen Juneman. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Many of you know that I have spent most of my life in Maplewood. I grew up here and now have lived with my husband Greg for over 40 years in the Parkside neighborhood. Whether referring to my years as a community activist, there were 22 of those years, or my time on the city council, my focus has been the common good and quality of life issues, public safety, parks and natural resources, high quality public services, and economic financial sustainability. I am proud of serving with the current council as, and staff as we strive to provide excellent services, innovative policies in police and fire, continued protection of our natural resources, including parks and open space, create expanded housing options, all the while remaining vigilant over our financial sustainability. Thank you, Kathy Juneman. Next, we have Bill Knudsen. Uh, thank you, Kitty. Um, thanks to the League of Women Voters for this opportunity. I'm Bill Knudsen. I'm seeking re-election to the Maplewood City Council. My wife and I have lived in Maplewood for 38 years and raised three boys who attended the Roseville schools. Prior to my current service, my main contribution to Maplewood had been to develop St. John's Hospital and serve as administrator for many years. I'm continuing my career in healthcare as the CEO of a nursing home cooperative serving 8,000 seniors. What, I'm, what interested me in seeking office was the EMS task force that I served on in 2016. It was, I was deeply impressed with the charge and structure of the task force whereby six citizens, volunteers, supported by amazing city staff, made some of the most difficult recommendations about fire and ambulance services that you can possibly imagine. With my business background, I was elected president of the Maplewood Economic Development Authority. We have projects under construction including London Crossing, which was a former fire station, we have, and that project will include a high percentage of affordable and market rate. We have projects in the Gladstone area and the mall area that are currently under review, including affordable and market rate. I'm a stickler for financial planning and, and sticking to an approved budget. I also believe that budgets are flexible and like our reductions and restrictions during COVID, we did what needed to be done. We have a triple or a double A plus bond rating and that needs to be absolutely retained. As an economic development uh, authority focus, I am interested in scattered site affordable housing. Our group, the Economic Development Authority, worked with the Uni University of Minnesota graduate students to look at methods um, to acquire abandoned homes and sell them to affordable and first time home buyers. Uh, with my support, the MS leadership group committed to a community paramedic program, ultimately offering services to people that would call 911 that, that can't go to the hospital. They don't need to go. And including that, we also looked at the supports that social worker staffing can, can do to assist our, our departments. Thank you. Thank you, Bill Knudsen. Our last um, reading will be from Patricia Timmons, and this was a statement that was submitted in advance. 
Good evening, fellow neighbors. I sincerely regret that I'm unable to attend this forum in person. An important family event has taken me out of state at this time. A little about me. I lived in Maplewood until I was 14. I have since lived in the South and on the East Coast. This has provided me a diverse background and understanding of what makes a wonderful place to live. I am a VP at a global financial firm. I previously served at, as on Elko's New Market City Council and various boards and commissions in Scott County. My previous council experience showed me how important it was to be available and responsive. We had a small tax base and always needed to do more with less. This drove a very carefully managed budget. I am seeking a seat on the council to help responsibly guide us forward. Maplewood is an aging city that will require care and vision. Infrastructure will require maintenance, more available senior housing, and improved services. I have spoken with a number of you regarding the Purple Line. This will provide important public transportation to a critical corridor. Together we can work to get the Med Council to complete this project with the least impact to our wildlife and green space. It is important to have quality, affordable housing. This needs to be diverse in nature and not just focused on single-family homes. We need to listen to our business community and assist them, assist them as we can. Changes in transportation and housing can have a positive impact for them. Ensuring that we as a city are an efficient partner in onboarding new business is critical. A city reputation can either attract or drive away potential growth. I would like to see more community events. It is important for us to gather to build relationships and foster goodwill. I ask each of you to look out for your neighbor. That is core to what makes us a great city. Thank you for considering me for this vital role. It would be my honor to serve this community. Thank you, Patricia Timmons. Okay, now we will um, start with our questions. Um, the first question we have, um, you'll have one and a half minutes to answer. Do you have any specific vision for Maplewood? If yes, what is it? So this will first, we go to uh, Kathleen. Well, I think the vision has already been set. We've been moving forward in spite of pandemic, in spite of crime rising, particularly outside of the city. In spite of lots of challenges, we have been making um, a plan to move forward for several years now. And our biggest focus has been variety of housing. We have every level of income that we need to help house and help attract to our community. We have businesses who say we want workers, so we would like them to live here. It, our, my vision is to keep expanding upon what we've been doing and to make sure that we give opportunity to all people. We are right now in the last three years, but particularly now, we are trying to focus on diversity and inclusion. Too broad a topic to talk about in a minute and a half. But nonetheless, that's part of what drives our strategic planning and is particularly important if you're thinking about employment and housing. Thank you, Kathleen. Mar Mary Lee. Thank you very much. You know, I agree with Council Member Juniman. I think we're already setting the vision for Maplewood. I see Maplewood as a place where uh, People want to come. This is an inclusive community. It's welcoming. Uh, we are supportive of businesses. We create jobs. And I think most importantly that we offer a wide variety of housing options. We've been working really, really hard on that. Right now we have several housing uh, projects that are coming to our Frost English area, a cooperative for seniors. Uh, we have, uh, that's over on Lake Phelan. Uh, today I put the shovel in down at London Lane for mixed rate housing. Uh, so I think it's really important that we offer a wide variety of housing and that we do what we can to encourage uh, businesses to come here to that we can retain them and that they can grow here. We've been working really hard with that, with keeping our businesses and finding places for them to expand if they need to. Uh, I also want to make sure that we protect our parks. In Maplewood, we have over 930 acres of parks, preserves, and open space. We've got 36 parks and 15 preserves and open space. We have a lot of trails, which really, that goes to the quality of life that we have here in Maplewood, and I want to preserve that. That's my vision, that this is a destination where people want to come, they want to live here, raise their families, and they want to retire here. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mary Lee. Diana? The vision that I see for Maplewood is a resident-centered vision. The residents of Maplewood, they love their parks, their trails, their open space. They do not want to see part of their park turned into a park and ride and to lose that parkland to the construction of a park and ride for a project that they see will not be well utilized. The other vision I see is that from many of the small business owners, they want to have more of a two-way dialogue with City Hall. They want to have more influence on the decisions being made at City Hall so it's more centered on our small businesses and their needs rather than the direction and the policies that are set and promoted by the Metropolitan Council. The other vision that I see is that Maplewood is jealously protecting their parks, their trails, and their open space. And it is so important that we protect the Bruce Vento Trail, which is one of the top 10 trails in the state of Minnesota, and that it is something that we are known for in Maplewood. It is one of our top amenities, and we must maintain that within our vision. It is not only an important greenway under our comprehensive plan, but it is also important to our quality of life. Thank you, Diana. Bill? Thank you. Um, I think it, it's important to recognize that um, Maplewood as a first ring suburb has uh, both development and redevelopment to consider. But we, the fundamental strategy, philosophy, vision has to be that <clears throat> it's a great place to live and it's a great place to work. That means we need diversity in everything we do, recognizing our population is becoming diverse. Uh, we need to recognize that not everyone can afford every, every opportunity to, to own a home. So <clears throat> again, with our economic development authority and the investments we're going to make, I think we can provide um, opportunities for people to live here. Ultimately, um, we need to pre provide opportunities for people to work here. I sit on the design review board and the planning commission, and I can assure you that our support for small business and our ability to support those businesses from building and operating their businesses in a comfortable way in Maplewood is absolutely what we do. And I think I'm adamant about that, um, that every business opportunity in Maplewood needs to be fair and it needs to be preserved and it needs to represent ultimately uh, the interests of Maplewood. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Uh, this next question was received by numerous uh, members of the community, and so I've tried to combine the various questions into one, so it's a little bit complex, so have to bear with me. We will give you two minutes to answer this question because of its complexity. Uh, what is your position on the purple line and why? Please include in your answer the impact of both the current state of low ridership and the impact on the Bruce Vento Trail, and whether you support alternatives like having it run along Highway 61 to avoid impact on the trail. <coughs> Would you like me to repeat that? It's kind of a complex question. Um, so what is your position on the purple line and why? Please include in your answer the impact of both the current state of low ridership and the impact on the Bruce, Bruce Vento Trail, and whether you support alternatives like having it run along Highway 621 to avoid the impact on the trail. So this question goes first to Kathleen. Boy, I got the short straw two times in a row. Uh, <laughs> um, my position is on the Bruce Vento Trail is that that's a trail, but my position on the purple line is that the East Metro has waited a long time for a major um, mass transit option. And we cannot just turn it down because we don't like it. So we have to look at all, all the possibilities. But I have to say that for over three years now, um, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of research and a lot of polling of people and a lot of engineering studies done and running along Highway 61 isn't an option. If it were, we might have seized it, but it's not. Uh, bus rapid transit, not unlike um, light rail, I'm so glad we're not having light rail, um, is that it, 
be on a separate roadway of some kind so that it can make time. You have stations like you do for a train in other cities. It doesn't stop at every corner. That's why it can be done in an in a, uh, effective fashion to get people from one place to another. It's a very difficult thing to think about it running on the Bruce Vento Trail. But if we go back in time, the Bruce Vento Trail <laughs> was established in 1992, and that's when Ramsey County bought the property under the auspices of the Ramsey County Regional Rail Authority. They've owned it all this time. And in that amount of time, they and the um, uh, Metropolitan Council have looked at this as a way of a, possibil a good possibility of where we they might run rapid or massive transit. As a matter of fact, every so many feet, there's been a sign since 1992, possible future home of mass transit. So what we have to do is work out a way where we can run the Purple Line and also have our recreational trail along with all the uh, native plantings and screening that we demand here in Maplewood. Thank you, Kathleen. Diana? The Bruce Vento Trail, as I mentioned, is one of the top 10 trails in the state of Minnesota. And officially, as being labeled the Bruce Vento Trail, it turns 21 years old t this year. Now, the trail itself has a beautiful treed canopy that has been growing for the last 21 years. It's beautiful. Now, the one thing that isn't talked about in all of these plans is the fact that the plans require that it be clear cut 100 feet across from side to side, all the way from Larpenter north to the Maplewood Mall. That is the extent of what the construction of the Purple Line on the Bruce Vento Trail produces. Now the question about Highway 61. I have actually done some study into what are the best practices for developing a bus rapid transit. I actually went out to Richmond, Virginia, and I looked at their bus rapid transit, which is the star project that most projects look at for its success. I talked to the transportation manager out there in Richmond, Virginia, and I talked to him for an hour about best practices. And putting the BRT on the Bruce Vento Trail does not meet the best practices. Highway 61 actually does meet the best practices. It's a commercial thoroughfare Sure, you can put your sidewalks in, your walkability there, and that is the backbone from there then the feeder buses from the residents come to then that commercial corridor. And that's the way the BRT in Richmond, Virginia is set up. And that is typically the way that you will see by best practices the way that these types of projects are constructed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Diana. And next we have Bill. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I get zero calls from constituents supporting the project and many, many calls uh, against the project. Uh, many of the calls are kind of uninformed, so it really helps to know a lot of detail around the project, as uh, uh, Commissioner Juneman, or <coughs> Councilmember Juneman suggested. Um, I'm kind of keeping an open mind on this. I really support uh, public transit, uh, you know, for our future. Uh, but I think this project is really troubled. Um, I think it's troubled more from efficacy um, than perhaps the Bruce Vento Trail. My, my study and look at what the plans are and what the options could be really doesn't suggest it would ruin the trail. In fact, in some cases, it might enhance the trail. Um, but my overall concern is just the ridership, the efficacy, and is it the right time? especially with the West Metro problems that the that Met Council is having. You know, should we really take a closer look at this project? I had the opportunity as a representative of Maplewood to put five people on the public commission to look closely at this. And I looked at the applications very carefully because I wanted those that were pro for the project and pros that would against it and those people that would possibly use the project. So I put five people that I trust 
on the commission, and I'm really anxious to hear what they have to say. Because the first time I saw one of the members was at the uh, night out, and he said something happened, the feds re rejected the project. So, you know, the, it really needs a reset. But I'm not worried about the Vento Trail, I'm worried about the efficacy of the entire project. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Mary Lee? Thank you very much. This is a really timely question right now because the Met Council is in a period of reassessment of the Vento Trail. Uh, we are expecting very soon that there will be an announcement that there will be public engagement meetings concerning the trail. A lot of things have changed. Uh, the pandemic, uh, ridership, uh, there's a question, I have raised questions about safety on uh, transit, uh, as well as the ridership question. Some of the facts that uh, the Purple Line relied on were pre-pandemic, and we know that everything has changed and that many people are working from home. So right now, the Met Council is reassessing the Purple Line, and I am encouraging everyone to please weigh in on it. Uh, all you have to do is take a look at a transport, uh, transportation map of the metro. And you will see that the Western Metro has a lot of transportation. But as Mr. Knudsen just indicated, yes, the Met Council is revisiting what's happening with the Blue Line. And I believe it's also very appropriate at this time to be reconsidering and reassessing the, the Purple Line. Uh, the uh, Purple Line has been something that has been discussed for a very, very long time. And I will agree that we need transportation on the East Metro. The question is, what does that transportation look like? I love the Bruce Vento Trail. I rode bikes on it with my sons. I, uh, in my younger years, I rollerbladed on the, on the trail, and I've walked the trail many, many times. It's a beautiful trail. It is a great asset. And as a Cub Scout leader, I cleaned up the trail with Cub Scouts on many different occasions. I believe we can protect the Bruce Vento Trail, and we can explore the Purple Line, and where should it run? This is the time to do it. The federal government has withdrawn the funding on it, and we are basically at a point of reset, and this is an important time for everyone to weigh in on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee. Well, the next question we have, you'll have 90 seconds to answer. What ideas do you have to address the increase in crime in Maplewood and make our community safer? What ideas do you have to address the increase in crime in Maplewood and make our community safer? Bill, you are first on this one. Yes. Um, you know, I want to go straight out. I support the police. I support their community um, focus, uh, their diversity and all that. But they can't solve uh, the emerging crime. This is a respect problem. Uh, people just have, have not, don't respect um, the traditional law and the traditional authority. So this has to be core. I mean, this has to be from schools to juveniles to families to every part of our community. Uh, businesses, uh, you know, um, it was interesting listening to that new public safety um, person in, in Minneapolis. He was all over businesses. I couldn't quite figure out exactly what he wanted them to do. Um, but he, he's trying everything. And I think that's really what we need to do. Um, this is core. Um, to our civilization and, and core to our community. And, um, you know, if you see something, say something, that kind of thing. This afternoon, I'm in my front porch and there's seven squad cars coming by, um, all going after, a, 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 you know, a, apparently someone that uh, was a shooting suspect from uh, somewhere in St. Paul. I mean, so we, we all have to be vigilant. Uh, the police uh, are engaged in the community and we support that. Uh, but this is a comprehensive problem, and it needs to be more respect. Thank you, Bill. Diana? Yes, this is a question that I hear quite often from people who are concerned. They are concerned that much of what they hear about the crime in Maplewood and that their source of that information is next door. They would like to have more information coming from City Hall. And so my proposal is, is that we better utilize our Maplewood Monthly. That in our Maplewood Monthly that we address uh, what steps people can take in their homes or in their communities to be more safe and how to watch uh, more vigilantly. 
Um, I would also put in there more st on the statistics of where the hot spots are in Maplewood so that people are aware and that they can also, again, keep their eyes open and, and be vigilant about it because it is a community issue. Uh, the other thing that I think that would be very helpful is that, of course, we have neighborhood watches here in Maplewood, but I think we can do more to uh, foster neighborhood watches and to rejuvenate them and, and put together a program that invigorates our neighborhood watch program together with addressing uh, preventative um, measures that can be taken uh, with regard to crime in our Maplewood Monthly as well as publishing the statistics as to the current crime tr trends and where those crimes are occurring so we can be watchful. Thank you, Diana. Mary Lee. Thank you. I completely support our public safety department. They are absolutely critical to the well-being of our community. We are working very hard at making sure that our public safety department represents the diversity in our community in terms of our hiring both in police and fire. I was instrumental in bringing two social workers from Ramsey County who are now embedded in our uh, public safety department because what they can offer is that they can decriminalize mental health issues because a lot of calls for police services really are uh, individuals that are in mental health crisis and that has been as I indicated in my opening that has been a game changer. I raised my voice about the increase in crime and the trouble that I had with the fact that so many cr um, crimes seem to be committed by people who were uh, either released from the court system uh, or they were released uh, uh, without any kind of accountability. I did that at a mayor's uh, conference. And as a result, I was invited to participate in the crime reduction leadership team in Ramsey County. We meet on a regular basis with John Choi and with judges, and what we're looking for is real solutions. What can we do? In particular, we're looking at juvenile crime, which is a very troubling thing, in that juvenile crime has been up in this post-pandemic time that we have. I also support our, our public safety department when it comes to new technology. We have new technology that is amazing that helps reduce uh, um, police pursuits uh, while still being able to uh, watch your the, the criminals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mary Lee. And last we have Kathleen. <laughs> I go from under the gun to after everybody else talks. Uh, <laughs> um, I agree with almost everything everybody has said. Um, and I'm possibly the, maybe the only one here. I've been a neighborhood crime watch captain since 1980. I established the second crime watch group in the city. Um, yeah, they call me Grandma Crime Watch, thanks. Anyway, uh, what I learned from that and what we did pulling together is we need to remember how to be good neighbors. Everybody's in such a hurry. Everybody needs to be somewhere. The kids have to get to this. You know, you have a an evening meeting, but what we've lost is the sense of neighborhood. And we can't watch out for each other without some sense of neighborhood. That doesn't mean you storm into your neighbor's kitchen with a cup of coffee in your hand. But it does mean you're familiar with their patterns, who comes and goes, what seems normal for them. And if it doesn't seem normal, you, do, you dial 911. You don't sit and think about it. That's what you do. That's part of why the police can't prevent all crime. They don't have eyes on the backs of their heads. And they can't be in every neighborhood all the time. So they do need our eyes and ears. And they need our dedication to support their efforts to keep us safe. And I agree with Bill. It starts at home, and we need to encourage it in schools, churches, youth organizations, parent groups. We have to get back to the fact that there is some authority in life, and you have to do things that maybe you don't like to do, and you'd rather do something on your own, when in fact, if you live in any kind of a society, there are rules. And I think we need to quit backing down the hall. At some point, we say, please, teach your kids to care for each other. Thank you, Kathleen. The next question, do you support restoring public comment at city council meetings? Please explain the rationale for your position. Do you support restoring public comment at city council meetings? Please explain the rationale for your position. In this question, we begin with Mary Lee. Thank you very much. 
Today we have so many different ways to reach out and speak to city council members. In Maplewood, we don't represent a particular area. We don't have a, a, a system where we have a ward that we are responsible for or that elects us. We are responsible for the entire city, and I take that very seriously. I have a personal motto where I return every email and every phone call within 24 hours. And many times I get the comment that, wow, you really replied quickly, yes, because I take this seriously. It is important. I want to hear what people have to say. Public comment is something that anyone can contact any city council member at any time through email, through a phone call. They can meet us here at City Hall. I've done that many, many times. I've met with uh, residents uh, for coffee. Uh, the public comment section of our city council meeting is something that we have tried many different things. And what we found is that we had the same individuals who were coming, and really they were using it as a press opportunity. And it really wasn't public comment, and it was scaring off everybody. And so we tried a variety of different things. And what we found is that we don't have any complaints about public comment because people know how accessible we are and how responsive we are and how much we take it very seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee. Next, we have Kathleen. Thank you, moderator. Um, I agree with the mayor, and I guess I have a few more treads on my tire than she does in this area because I've been sitting here longer. And I, we have been through absolutely every iteration of what people want to call public comment, resident input, citizen input, whatever you want to call it. But I agree with the mayor, things have changed so much. That was a carryover actually from the 60s and 70s when there wasn't, weren't just many ways to get a hold of your council person other than telephone. Um, but we do, I mean, you know, we all get many emails and I, I like to answer an email with a phone call personally. It has an element of surprise in it, shall we say. But I like a voice behind the words. So if it's something that's that important, I like to answer to the person voice to voice. But I do think that there are so many ways that you can get a hold of any one of us or all of us in, believe me, if something comes to all of us, it comes up. And so then we decide, should we put it on the agenda or I personally very often just call a person and say, okay, this is the staff person you start with to solve your problem. If that doesn't work, let me know. And if it's something of enough intensity that it involves a lot of people, affects a lot of people, then we have the option to approach the city manager and say, I think this needs to go on the agenda. Then it's brought up to the whole council and we decide whether it should come to us or not. Thank you, Kathleen. Next we have Diana. I support returning public comment to the City Council agenda. And this is why. Yes, you can communicate with your City Council members and your mayor by email, by phone call, by seeing them at the grocery store, but that doesn't necessarily have the same level of attention that your comments as a resident would receive at a city council meeting. You cannot see the body language of your council members and your mayor when you send an email. You can't necessarily see it when you're talking to them on the phone. You might hear it, but you don't necessarily see it. There's something fundamental about being able to believe, even though you may never go to a council meeting yourself, to believe that a person has that opportunity to address the council, the body as a whole. And it shouldn't be about whether or not if your issue, which is the pothole in the middle of your road, whether or not it is an issue that affects, uh, what was it said, uh, a large number of people. That should not be the criteria of whether or not it comes to the level of importance. If it's important to you, the resident, it is important and should be before the council. Thank you, Diana. Bill? I have, <clears throat> during my time, um, 
we had that public comment phase for a period of time. I observed absolutely nothing useful about it. Um, there seemed to be almost people that were looking at conspiracy theories to come and rant and rave. It made no sense whatsoever. It didn't help anybody. Um, if for some reason civility could uh, be observed, I would be more than happy to support it. But um, understanding first and foremost that there has to be an issue that's relative to the community, something that could be helpful, and uh, something that could be done in a civil fashion. Thank you, Bill. The next question is what options are there for revitalizing Maplewood Mall? What options are there for revitalizing Maplewood Mall? 90 seconds. First, we have a Diana. Okay. I have thought a lot about the revitalization of the Maplewood Mall. And of course, the council has uh, adopted a plan of how they would like to guide the Maplewood Mall so that part of it remains commercial, part of it is then housing. But you see, by doing so, what that does in some instances is that it creates uncertainty in the marketplace. So that if there is, for instance, a commercial developer or a corporation who's looking to uh, relocate uh, to such an excellent location right off of 694 and a transportation corridor, they may say, well, I don't know, we might have to go through a lot of hurdles in order to bring our plan to fruition. There's a lot of trends out there that can be looked at with regard to what types of redevelopment occur in shopping centers and, and different areas. Certainly the Sears building, and I've talked to some IT people who are in the know, the Sears building is a perfect location for a server farm. Uh, because of the height of the ceilings, rather than the plan that the city has, let's lop it off and put housing there, we could keep it commercial, which is its best and highest use. Uh, the mall area is a prime commercial area, and that is its best and highest use next to a Please. major thoroughfare. Thank you. Diana, uh, Mary Lee. Thank you. I am excited to say that in the next three to five years, the North End, what we call, uh, well, it's the Maplewood Mall area, is going to look completely different. And you probably have noticed some of those changes starting already. Uh, Becker Furniture just went in there and opened up uh, where Toys R Us was. Uh, I am here to tell you that the myth has been sold and the new developer is planning on putting housing at that site. The building will be demolished and they are, uh, the developers are working with city staff right now as to what those plans look like so that they fit into our city ordinances. You know, this isn't about what the council has planned. This is about the North End study. That was a robust citizen engagement process where a lot of people were engaged and businesses were engaged. St. John's Hospital staff were engaged to vision what might that look like. And we came alongside to say that our community cares about that whole mall area, and this is the vision that we have. But of course, uh, Sears right now is owned by Seritage after Sears closed. Uh, Seritage is also working with our city staff, and their plan as the owners of the property is that they would potentially demolish the building and that they would put housing there, because we all know that housing is something that we need. So. Keep an eye on the North End, on our Maplewood Mall area, because it's going to change. I'm happy to say that the mall is 90% filled with tenants right now. They've taken a new direction. So keep an eye out. Thanks. Thank you. Mary Lee. Um, Kathleen? Sure. Her last two words, and she has to take my thunder. <laughs> the, the mall is taking, it has taken a new direction. Um, and they, they obviously have looked around and talked around and found out that they could do some changing up of their own school of thought and att attract a whole new type of business. And so it's working so far. And I do think that we went through the, the um, whole process of hiring a consultant, a very good consultant who does this all over the country. That's where the North End Study started, came from. They guided it. 
and they said, we have a treasure there. It's always meant to be a destination, but we have to change what kind of destination. And that we need probably provides a little more option for entertainment. We certainly need a place for restaurants that you don't whiz through the drive through And that people will want to be part of that. And the other thing, they, they're the ones who brought basically the housing idea to us because, you know, and it's kind of true everywhere, wherever there, there are people, there are needs. And so people who live there would be, it would be right at their fingertips. And the business all around the mall, businesses have been successful. When this study was done, they were all doing quite well. And most of them have bounced back from the pandemic. So we know the area can sub support business, but you also need people. And we also, the people we have heard from the businesses that they need people to work for them and a place to live. Thus the combination. Thank you, Kathleen. Bill? I think a lot of times we overstate our ability to affect the market. Um, what we do is facilitate. Um, we do everything in our power to create um, and spend our money on consulting and so forth to look at what's the best opportunities in that area. I've had an opportunity to sit down with some developers. They like the idea that there's an organized plan. They like the idea that there's a lot of walking. They like the idea that the, we expect the storefronts to be right on the sidewalk. They like the idea that parking's in the back. Um, they like the idea that this thing has a face uh, that really looks like a community, looks like a small town. That's what we're looking for. Um, <clears throat> and again, I guess I don't have a ton more to add now that uh, Mary Lee <laughs> and Kathy and, and Diana have weighed in. But again, I, I, I think we have a, a very good plan. Um, I, I, I office near the Rosedale, and I don't think we're going to be Rosedale anytime soon. And, and uh, uh, on the other hand, they tore down herd burgers and are going to build housing there and, and all kinds of services that are around the mall to support that housing. So there, this the idea of mixed use, uh, live work, um, it's a theory that's been around for about 20 years, uh, hard to do, um, but I think we've got a good shot at uh, redeveloping. Plus, the Birch Run is going to be redeveloped. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. The next question we have is, do you to support bringing back Park and Rec under the city umbrella or continue to outsource? The author of this um, question indicated that the, they had observed that the outsourcing had reduced the amount of kids' activities. So do you support bringing back Park and Rec under the city umbrella or continue to outsource? And the question also includes around the kids' activity. That's the primary uh, driver for the question. Okay, so well, this time we start <clears throat> with Bill. I'm a little confused, but um, I spent uh, over the pan uh, pandemic and COVID period an opportunity. We had task forces, and I was on the Park and Rec task force. And that is a, a great mix of public and private um, people that weigh in on the recreation program. Uh, I think it's a great program, and I don't see any particular reason to change what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next, we have Marilee. Well, first off, Parks and Rec has become Parks and Natural Resources, uh, going along with the idea that Maplewood is very uh, parks and preserves and uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, that's our focus uh, uh, primarily. So. Uh, we had to make some really tough decisions during the pandemic because as you know, no one was programming. And so that gave us an opportunity to have two task forces, one to take a look at our, our uh, nature center and one to look at uh, how we were delivering parks and recreational services. And we brought in uh, residents and uh, uh, folks from different organizations that were interested in helping us plan for our future. And as a result, we are able to offer expanded services uh, and really focus more on some of the things that we do really well. Uh, we maintain 15 soccer fields, 23 baseball and softball fields, eight tennis courts, seven basketball courts. I mean, the, the list goes on. Uh, we are very outdoor focused in our community because of the way that we value uh, our outdoors, our parks, our preserves. And so by 
generating this new Parks and Natural Resources Department that goes an awful long way uh, in terms of how we can deliver services. We have 10 full-time staff that work in two different locations in Parks and Natural Resources, and the duties cover planning and maintenance, forestry, special events, uh, environmental education, which is really important, and a lot up. more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Kathleen. Well, I, like Bill, was fortunate enough to be the uh, liaison to one of those task forces. It was the Nature Center Task Force. And what we found is that people see the Nature Center not as much as a park as it is a place to learn environmentally. So that told us something about we always gl glom them together, which sort of seems normal or natural, but it wasn't as natural as we thought. And so when it, what the pandemic did it was force us to reevaluate this. And I think what's going to come out of it is better all the way around. I think the Nature Center is going to have a resurgence. We have staff working out of there now. The building is open. And we have uh, new cooperative efforts with 4-H, with school districts, with people who, who do certain craft type programs. They would love to work out of there with us. So that's going to come back slowly. And the park and rec, I think, will always be sort of what I call a combo meal. We will continue to do what we've been doing, which is a way to get something started again and expand on that. But we have two park people working at the Nature Center, and they are parks people. So they do work on programs. And one of the things that they're also looking into is, once this pandemic thing quits hanging over us, that the why will be brought back into programming. Because they used to do day camps and all those things, and that all went away with pandemic. And so we have the we have the ability because we have the building bricks to put back together. It's just going to look a little different than it has in the past. Thank you. Um, Kathleen, Diana? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Certainly. Um, do you support bringing back Parks and Rec under the city umbrella or continue to outsource? And the writer of this um, believes that outsourcing resulted in a reduction in kids' activities. OK. Um, my answer to the first part of that question is yes. I think that we should have our programming through Maplewood so that we can have Maplewood centered focused uh, programming. But until uh, that change occurs, uh, I think that the council should provide a report to the residents of Maplewood um, at least on a quarterly basis, a comparison between how it, uh, the participation levels before the change was made and what the current uh, participation is now after the change so that there's a better measurement to determine if it was the right move or not. And certainly there's going to be a little variability because of COVID, but uh, still I think that you can do a certain amount of factoring uh, in looking at that analysis and maybe reaching out to uh, people in the community to find out um, how their participation went, uh, what they would do better. And so in the meantime, um, before it's uh, returned back to uh, the umbrella of City Hall uh, and our Parks and Recreation Department uh, providing uh, these um, programs, uh, that there should be uh, reporting done as to uh, keeping the residents informed. Thank you, Diana. The next question is, what is your position on the amount and location of affordable housing? Please include your thoughts on why it seems to be centered in certain areas today and does not include, in, um, does not include a mix of single-family and multi-unit housing. So what is your position on the amount and location of affordable housing? Please include your thoughts on why it seems to be centered in certain areas today and does not include a mix of single family and multi-unit housing. So first, uh, this time is Kathleen. Oh, goody, I get a bonus again. Um, first of all, a lot of our affordable housing in Maplewood is owner occupied. It's already in neighborhoods. Close to 70% of our housing is owner occupied and affordable, various levels of affordable granted, but it is. And if it seems that it's landing in some certain places, that's only partially true. Um, it depends on how you, I guess, interpret what you hear. 
because I do think that the buzzword affordable makes people kind of go berserk. Affordable has levels, and it's whether you can afford to pay your rent or your house payment and still buy shoes for your kids and feed them and so on. And if you pay attention to the way of the world right now, there's an increasing number of people who can't afford to live in an owner-occupied house. And so we have to provide some kind of decent rental living. And uh, as the mayor pointed out, she just turned the shovel today on one and down in, at the location of the old fire station way down. And that's a mixed development, every, every level of affordability and, and market rate. And we also have um, some properties now in Gladstone. I'm sure nobody's crying about the Gladstone house disappearing. Um, that will be affordable again at certain levels, but there's 30%, 60%, and 80% of the average middle income, median income in the whole metropolitan area. Think about being at the 30% level. You have to live somewhere. Thank you, Kathleen. Next we have Bill. Thank you. Um, I think Maplewood has a great opportunity, and you know, relative to where locations are right now, I mean, that's what's available. Um, our London Lane um, project that uh, Mary Lee and I, uh, again, did the groundbreaking this morning, a uh, very exciting project. Um, it was a very difficult property. We had, uh, it took a long time to, to get the right mix. So Maplewood is very careful about um, our developers, especially around affordable and what kind of benefits they get. This particular project is going to have a, a strong mix of uh, what, you know, some could be considered workforce, some could be affordable and some market rate. And what we expect out of developments like this is that the owners and developers actually operate the property. So they'll be on site and, and, and take care of these properties as they should. Um, just to venture into a different uh, aspect of all this, over the last year, we've had uh, an opportunity to work with graduate students in the University of Minnesota um, uh, Humphrey School. Um, to look at options for single-family conversions uh, for abandoned homes and things like that. We have numerous opportunities in other communities to learn. We have numerous opportunities to get support from our, our vocational schools, and that's an, a project we want to really dig into. Um, again, my leadership in the Economic Development Authority is going to focus on converting those single-family homes to affordable and for first-time home buyers. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Next, we have Mary Lee. Thank you. I think the number of uh, that we're actually focusing on is that more than 70% of Maplewood residents are already naturally occurring affordable homes anyway at some point and level. Uh, in terms of my position on the amount of affordable housing, I will say that we need a lot of housing and a wide variety of housing. We need higher end housing, we need senior housing, we need housing for veterans, we need workforce housing, uh, which basically, uh, if you really take a look at what workforce housing is, it's uh, typically the, the income of, let's say, a school teacher or a police officer, and we also need affordable housing. Now, in terms of the location, I will say that my time on the council and as mayor, I have come to understand that affordable housing logically should be located where there is access to transportation, where there is access to food, and where there is also jobs and businesses where people can find jobs. Uh, one of the areas that I think is ripe for affordable housing, uh, in addition to some of the things that we have already going right now, is the Rice Larpenter area. It is what's called the old Zittle property because of its proximity to, to food and to transportation and to jobs. Conversely, I have taken the position that the beautiful land down at the ponds is not amenable to affordable housing because it is a food desert and there's no transportation in that area or any jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee. And we have Diana. It is important in a community to have all levels of housing to meet the needs of the residents. And Maplewood has certainly been a champion of this since as long as I've lived here in 1983. One of the reasons I moved to Maplewood because I could buy a single family home 
that was affordable to me at that time, starting out with a new family. And that, of course, is what we want to have our community, to be an affordable community for not only the new young families coming into Maplewood, but also for our seniors who have been here many years or who may be new transplants uh, to Maplewood and have moved here uh, just recently. Now, the question about why is there a concentration in some neighborhoods of um, more affordable housing, and that word affordable, of course, there's always a, a little wiggle room in that because as Ms. Juniman mentioned, there are different levels of affordability depending upon what kind of programs are being implemented. But in the Gladstone area, for instance, the city of Maplewood purchased four properties there, all of them above their market value. One was $100,000 over its market value. Another one, $149,000 over its market sentence. value. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next question is, um, what do you see as the impact of climate change in Maplewood, and what environmental initiatives would you propose for our community? What do you see as the impact of climate change in Maplewood, and what environmental initiatives would you propose for our community? Diana, you're first on this one. Certainly, I think it is important to preserve our tree canopies as much as possible because that is the first natural defense against climate change is not to cut down all the trees such as the clear cutting that would be required to put the purple line on the Bruce Vento Trail. The amount of shrubbery that might be replanted will never replace the level of trees that are removed when it's clear cut 100 feet across from Larpenter all the way to the Maplewood Mall. That is a substantial swath of greenery. With regard to initiatives, certainly I believe that we need to have improved transit and uh, public transportation in Maplewood. And we can do that by taking a look at our current bus routes that we have and understand why they are not working for our current residents. And I think that with some adjustments, we can make our current bus routes and their frequency more amenable to our, our residents, uh, and perhaps they will use the bus more. Or maybe they won't use the bus more if the Metropolitan Council cannot figure out how to uh, change the issue of crime on the public transportation. Uh, climate change is a very complicated issue in Maplewood. Thank you, Diana. Mm. Uh, next we have Bill. Yeah. I think climate change and certainly this area is in drought. Um, we have everything from lawns to, um, you know, water reserves drying up and it's critical that we continue to support and, and allow those things to thrive. Um, ultimately, <coughs> You know, Maplewood is involved in um, in, develop, in planting trees every year. Um, one of the things that's fascinating relative to the impact on trees is when we do our design review and do our planning, um, we expect um, any tree cut down is replaced. Um, we even do caliper measurements to make sure that there's an equal number of board feet that come back. So we do things that are, are we know are important to the environment. and. Um, we do things to, to encourage um, utilization of resources. One of the things that's interesting about Maplewood is all the parks and services we have. Um, we think in this new environment of work at home that people are going to really uh, begin to use um, Maplewood resources. Uh, one of the things I read about real estate is that if this new work at home option is people like to look out at a park. They like to have a park available uh, close. So I think. Uh, with that opportunity, um, certainly commuter traffic and use of cars and stuff will decrease. Um, but generally speaking, I think uh, Maplewood is an environmentally sensitive organization. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Next we have Kathleen. Finally, something up my alley. <laughs> um, 
We can't avoid whatever you want to call it. People don't like to hear the word climate change, and they don't want to hear about climate warming, and you don't have to call it anything in particular. Just observe what's happening around you. Observe what's happening in the rest of the world. Observe what's happening on the East Coast and the West Coast. Observe what's happening right here. We are one of the first cities in the state to actually have um, a climate adaptation plan that we have formatted. And that's a way to start. And what you do then is prioritize which things you should begin with and how are you going to get that done. And what we need to think about a lot when you're running a city, the impact of climate change is incredibly huge if you look at no further than the infrastructure. We used to build storm sewers to accept 100 years rain until we had 200 years rain in three different summers. That takes care of that. So if you don't plan, that's why you need a climate adaptation plan to look how you will take care of things, how you will maintain the public health during such changes. How do we change our habits? And the fact that we are sponsoring things like the tree sale and people, they're gone and instantaneously, it tells you people want to. So that's why we are trying to create ways for people to have an effect on their own future environmentally. By the way, our climate adaptation plan plan is online. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, this will be the, I think it will be the last question. If it goes quickly, we might have a lightning round. Um, please share the role model that inspired you to want to serve as mayor or on the city council. I didn't answer the question. Oh, I'm so on sorry. Environmental. I apologize. Thank you very much for bringing that up Certainly. forward. <laughs> and it's really an important question. Uh, and whether or not you call it climate change, I think all you have to do is take a look at the news and see the fires, uh, the drought that's happening in, in many parts in our country, out in the West, or in the world, uh, to realize that maybe there is something changing. But whether or not you just want to talk about environmental sustainability or you want to talk about climate change, it is an important priority for the city of Maplewood. We have six strategic objectives that measures everything that the council does, one of them being environmental sustainability, so that when we're making a decision up here at the Diaz as a city council, we're looking at those six objectives and whether or not what we're doing will accomplish that objective. We also participate in a program called the Green Step Cities. We are at the fifth step in Green Step Cities, which is uh, a program that encourages cities to be sustainable, to really look at how they're using things at City Hall uh, and whether or not they are, are, are making decisions that are sustainable for our environment. All you have to do is take a look at what we did with our goat program. Uh, we had goats out here at City Hall so that we wouldn't use chemicals so that we could protect the environment. Uh, the goats came and were taking care of the buckthorn and I'm happy to say that they're coming back again. So we take this very seriously. Our council voted unanimously in favor of the climate adaptation plan and we are beginning to implement that. I think we're one of the only cities that has adopted such a plan. It's important, thanks. Thank you, Mary Lee. Um, then the last question is, please share the role model that inspired you to want to serve as mayor or on the city council. And Mary Lee, you're first on this one. A role model. You know, I have been very fortunate to have had grandparents and parents that I believed were wonderful role models on community engagement and serving our community. Uh, I know as a parent, I took my lead from them. Uh, when I required my two sons that they needed to find some volunteer project uh, that they could engage with the community and whether or not they were swim buddies or they volunteered at the Maplewood Public Library, uh, that was one of the things that was important to our family. So I really come from that, recognizing that I am part of a community. And I don't see myself as a politician. In fact, I don't think I'm a very good politician at all. I see myself as a public servant. I am here to serve, uh, because that's the way that I grew up, and that's where I'm committed. Uh, I also spend quite a bit of time reading about leadership. 
Uh, most recently, I'm reading the book Dare to Lead. Uh, I've read Lincoln on Leadership. I've got a whole series of books on leadership because I think it's important. I think it's a skill that we can develop, and it's something that at this point in my life, now that I am retired from my law practice, I can devote my time as a public servant to my community because that's really where I see this as a calling for something that uh, I'm looking forward to in my next term as mayor. Thanks. Thank you, Mary Lee. Next, we have Diana. When I think back to who my role model is, I would have to say that it's my mother. My mother was widowed and she raised her last two children by working really hard as an Avon lady and selling Electrolux vacuum cleaners. And I was her right hand man. And so much of what we did was putting together orders, answering the phone, figuring out how to solve problems for the people that she served, because that's what she did as a successful Avon lady, was to serve the people in the community so that they would give their business to her rather than the Ben Franklin down the street. And so I learned that from her. And another thing that I learned from her is that many of her friends were uh, elderly people and she would help them uh, in their day-to-day uh, -day life and different things that they might need. And so I learned from her the need to be uh, helpful to people and, and to look to their needs and to talk with people in a way that they understand what is being communicated. Because oftentimes people have misunderstandings if you cannot communicate with them in a way that they can relate to. And that is something I learned from my mom. And she was persistent, and she was tenacious, and she was cheerful. And all of those things, I like to be able to say that I can mimic Please, in, uh, in my actions uh, from my mom. Thank you. Bill? Oh, thank you. Uh, also have a role model in my mother and, and then another strong woman I'll talk to you about in a minute. But um, my mom <clears throat> used to volunteer uh, in North Minneapolis at a youth center. And she'd take the bus from Brooklyn Center down to North Minneapolis uh, many times a week. And, you know, it would affect our kids because she'd, she'd get home late and, you know, and be tired and so forth. But um, that devotion and stuff was, uh, was inspiring. Um, and so <clears throat> over the years, any opportunity I've had at church, um, I actually worked with Kitty for many, many years at uh, Roseville School District doing, doing, doing volunteer work, key work. Then the other option was uh, Mary Lee Abrams. She called me one night and she said, I've got a great opportunity to serve on an EMS committee and your background in healthcare will be very important. That really is an inspiration that got me interested ultimately in, in uh, seeking office. So there's two women that have uh, coached me quite a bit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. And Kathleen? Well, as an only child, I grew up in a household of two parents who were constantly on the move, helping other people. Um, I used to describe my childhood as the first 11 years I lived in the car while my mother drove from one volunteer activity to the other. And then uh, my father ran for office. He was on the Maplewood Council before it was called the council. It was, when it was the village of Maplewood and he was one of the first trustees. And so when I was a, about a 12 year old, instead of hanging around on the corner with my friends, I was, believe it or not, going and observing council meetings at night. It's a sickness. <laughs> so it was there from the beginning. And for myself to venture into it, I have to give, I don't know if it's credit or blame, to uh, former Representative Mindy Greiling, because I was an activist for over 20 years. And she f said to me, I don't know how many times, will you quit just being the one that's trying to get something buy somebody else and get up there and make some changes. So in the end, she was the one who said, will you just run for office already? So she's actually the one who started the recent, more recent, seemingly anyway, <laughs> sense of serving. 
Thank you, Kathleen. In closing, we apologize if your question was not asked. We can never get to all the issues in a limited format such as this. We encourage you to directly contact the candidates. The closing statements will be given in the reverse order as the opening statements. I will read Candidate Lee and Timmons' statements. Please remember you have two minutes to conclude your remarks. So in the reverse order, that makes Patricia uh, Timmons first. My core reason for running for council is to help ensure we all have a safe place to live with easily accessible goods and services, a place where we all feel we belong. That needs to be accomplished in a fiscally responsible manner. I am not politically driven. I have no agenda other than to do what is right based on provided facts and existing guidelines. I truly just want to provide my service to my community and give back in whatever way I can. I believe in volunteering and am a member of the Loyal Order of the Moose and an AARP volunteer. I pledge to be equitable and concise, to listen and be responsive. While I may not always give the answer you want to hear, I will answer. Thank you for considering me for this critical position. Patricia Timmons. Next, we have Bill. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you, listeners and viewers. It matters. Um, we get better with questions and feedback. Um, keeping 42,000 people and Maplewood citizens happy is really difficult. <laughs> Why am I doing that? Uh, to me, a great place to live and work is the guiding strategy for a city government. That means plowing, lower taxes, schools, infrastructure that works, places to relax, places to shop, places to run, and places to play. We participate and are affected by regional, state, and national politics, but most of our work is local. If there are any holes in this great city that I'm, the strategy that I'm talking about, we need to fill them. My interests, skills, and current contributions fit those strategies and attributes of a great place to live and work. I will work very hard to develop and redevelop both market rate and affordable housing as well as support business development. I would like to continue to serve on the design review board and the planning commissions as well as the president of the Economic Development Authority. I have a background in juvenile treatment and would like to help reduce the growth in juvenile crime. With my business background, I have an opportunity in many cases to weigh in on, any, on many issues and arrangements like our agreement with YMCA. I often get called um, to, to overlook uh, different agreements and different agree contracts. If asked, I'm also willing to serve on the next garbage committee. <laughs> that may sound a little tough, but it's a great, great opportunity. When we did the review of how trash and recycling is done, it is a very complex and important piece for the environment and for the efficacy of the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Next, we have Kathleen. Go garbage. As I said in my opening statement, my focus as a council member has consistently been on the quality of life and public services um, issues, <clears throat> specifically public safety, not only crime prevention, but also s supporting the public safety in their many innovative policies and projects. Their outreach is phenomenal. My first love was the environment and natural resource preservation, but it's kind of tied now with public safety. But um, I came with the idea that we have to start taking care of our, our environment if we want to live here and enjoy it. And it's caught on, I think. As the mayor said, we are at the top step in Green Step Cities. <laughs> We've been there for six years, so I call it 5.6. And uh, now we're actually measuring metrics, and so we know how to how to use uh, less greenhouse gas and so on. We are actually setting our goals based off of that. Um, obviously, I am very, very concerned about how well we preserve our open spaces and our, our natural resources, but my ultimate reason is kind of the canary in the coal mine. As we, as we take care of our environment or don't, we're kind of casting our own rocks into the future. We need to take care of everything around us, thus our tree preservation program and our wetland setback ordinance and so on. We are trying to keep things well so that we remain well. Uh, I'm also very aware of neighborhoods as well as housing. I said it at the beginning when I was talking about Crime Watch. 
We need a sense of neighborhood. It's why we care about each other. It's how we watch over each other. It's how we have common goals. And of course, it all depends on financial sustainability and the budget. So it all has to be kept in check by how do we afford this. I would very much like to continue to serve in this job and would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Next, we have Mary Lee. I want to say thank you to the League of Women Voters and to the candidates that are up here. Elections are really important, and I have come to learn during my time on the council and my time as mayor <clears throat> that there isn't anything more important than local government. And I want to suggest to all those watching that you have a choice as to what the future of Maplewood should look like. I am honored and I'm also humbled to have served on the council since 2014 and to serve in this role as mayor. It is a huge um, job in my estimation because I see my role as a leader in my community and I take that very, very seriously. You know, sometimes up here at the DS when I'm leading the, the, the council in our meetings, I recognize that we're all very different and that differences are inevitable. But division is a choice. And I believe that in making the decision for a leader that you should take a look at someone and their track record. What have they done? What have they said they will do? How do they treat people? And I will suggest that I will commit to continuing to serve my community with unwavering dedication and integrity. Our residents and our business community are always on the top of my mind. I have no hidden agendas. Maplewood needs a mayor who will listen to everyone, respond respectfully, and can be trusted to make good decisions. I have made those hard decisions as mayor during the pandemic to constrict our budget, to work with staff to creatively figure out how are we going to provide city services in the face of a worldwide pandemic. During our time of social unrest, I used emergency powers only to ensure the safety of the community. Maplewood needs a real leader, and I believe I am that leader. Please vote for me in my reelection. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee. Next, we have Chenbury Lee. Our city cannot move forward if there are gaps in the voices of representation. Maplewood is an evolving city. It continues to shift, grow, and improve. Our city cannot remain competitive with its neighbors, cannot attract or retain economic multiplicity, or be a desirable place to live if our city leaders are not representative of constituents. Diversity goes beyond a statement on paper or a checkbox. It goes beyond the differences that meet the eye. It is marked by our walks of life. As we conclude tonight's public forum, I ask your support in November as your friend and your neighbor to be your voice on the Maplewood City Council. I look forward to meeting you at your door. From Chunburi Lee. And last we have Diana. It's really been a pleasure to be here this evening to address these questions and to uh, share with you my viewpoints. Now we've heard a few different uh, comments about studies and about consultants and how that has really guided the path of Maplewood. Except that, with all of that, the one thing we didn't hear is that the path of Maplewood was shaped by the voice of the residents. And I think that that is very important because at the municipal level, that is where every person in our community has the greatest opportunity to be able to guide the public policy in their community. Maplewood is what is called a Plan B city. And what that means is, is that the mayor is the same as a council member in that what their vote is, in their um, ability to drive policy, we are all one and the same. The mayor cuts the ribbons and is the parliamentarian at the meetings. When we hear that the purple line is on pause or it's being reassessed, let's not be lulled into a false sense of security because until we know that the purple lines route is not 
on the Bruce Fento Trail, the Bruce Fento Trail will always be at risk. The Bruce Fento Trail is one of the top amenities that Maplewood is known for. Once it's gone, it's gone. And we've heard about the tree replacement policy. How in, po is it possible that all the trees will be replaced that are destroyed and putting Please the purple up. line down the Bruce Vento Trail? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to remind the viewing audience that the views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters is a nonprofit organization, and all the people involved in organizing and running this forum are volunteers. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I would like to acknowledge and thank the candidates who are serving their community by their willingness to participate in the democratic process of running for office. I would also like to thank the audience for watching your candidates discuss issues that are important to your community. This forum is currently being aired in its entirety on chapter, uh, Channel 16 in Maplewood and will be rebroadcast in its entirety on Channel 16 and is also available on demand at vod.maplewoodmn.gov. Every vote counts. This year, Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th. The polls are open from 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. You have the option of early voting and voting by mail. For any questions on voting, go to the Ramsey County website, the Elections and Voting section. Please remember to vote. Thank you and good night.